I don't think I've got any strength after this morning. <laughs> I, I can see you've done that, Councillor Barker. Thank you very much indeed. Right, good afternoon, fellow councillors, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, is there any apologies? Mr. Mayor, um, Councillor Alan Jack Graves. Okay. Councillor Anderson as well, I'm told. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Councillors Stanton and Foggart, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Um, you've all had the agenda. Any declarations of interest? None? Good. Okay. Uh, we're going to item three. Minutes of the meetings held on the 27th of February and the 19th of March. Can I have somebody propose those acceptance of those minutes, please? Right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you to you all for this morning. Very good of you. I appreciated how well attired you all were, which is uh, credit to you all. Thank you very much indeed. It is something that I think this chamber needs, that uh, the attire that we wear at our meetings uh, are in, in conjunction with... Um, um, we'll start to get this scene. In conjunction with how we should look as councillors in Derby, so I thank you all for uh, this morning. It's my pleasure to introduce first to you our new councillors. And I I'm going to take them in alphabetical order, and I would hope that you would appreciate uh, their election in the usual way. We have back with us, returning as a councillor, Ajit Atwell. Welcome back, Ajit. We have uh, a new uh, member, Kurt Cuss. Kurt. Um, now we have uh, a new Liberal Democrat, Daniel Lind. Yeah. A surprising new one here, like dad, like son, Alan Greaves Jr. I'm great, Jim. Very well, right. Two referees. Um, Chad Ward, my old ward. Jerry Pierce. Jerry. I mean, Jerry, can you clap as well, mate? We're both fans. Uh, yeah, well done, mate. Yeah. And welcome back to another council who's been with us before. And let me say, this is, to our knowledge, the first independent councillor ever to win in Derby council elections. So welcome back, Philip Ingle. Not you, Philip. And last but certainly not least, James Tesro. Mr Mayor, uh, Councillor Miles Patterson for Mickelover has joined us. Councillor Miles Patterson for Mickelover. Yeah, you're on the other side of the sheet. Sorry, I'm making me excuse it now. Right, okay. Mr. Mayor, um, sorry to interrupt you again. Would, it, would, would you consider allowing us to remove our jacket, jackets, meaning the temperature in the room today? Right, OK. Um, now, you should find on your desk in front of you some additional papers where you're signing to, in your agenda. It says to follow, and all those papers should be with you. If you haven't got, if anybody not got one? Anybody not got those papers? I presume, you, have you had a chance to look at them? Because we're going to go through them in a bit, and I want to make sure that everything's OK. OK.
having been shortlisted on nine other councils, and we've obviously done very well there. So that's uh, great for the council, and I think that deserves recognition. Um, so um, Home First, incidentally, was established in 2014 to provide integrated care, integrated care across Derby, and includes the teams working at Perth House, my old ward at Chad, and Arboretum House, very nice now, Arboretum Park, as well as the hospital to home term at the Royal Derby, where the member team has also won the team of the year, leader of the year award. I don't know who that is, but uh, I think that's tremendous, that is, whoever it is, and I'd like to congratulate them. If, uh, can we, oh, she's with us, or he is with us. They're all with us. Oh, well, we, I think we're going to make a presentation in a moment, so that could be good. Uh, well done to those, all of them. Uh, and I think three members of the team are going to come up with some awards, aren't they? Oh, well, that's great. Well, we'll do that next. Yeah, and I'll put my light on. Thanks. Uh, I'm glad I've got the leader of the council straight in front of me. He's certainly putting me right. Thank you very much. Yeah, OK. Now, yeah. Right, now, I have got some sad news now. It's always sad when we lose a council or a former councillor who has done great credit to this city. And unfortunately, we have lost Ernie Ball. Now, Ernie was a Labour councillor from 1974 to 1987. And he represented both Simpin and Osmiston Ward. And he was a great asset to this council. And I think it's appropriate that we all stand for a referee's minute. Hey, Alan, a referee's minute. In, uh, to mark respect for I, I, I'm told there's a little bit more on over the page which I've got to do uh, yeah would anybody like to say anything about uh, Mr Wood would anybody like to say anything either Councillor Wood Councillor Wood okay Bye, Tony. thank you I think I'm the only one um, Mr Mayor that served on this council with Ernie Bull so um, probably falls to me to say something about him he was one of those rare councillors um, who was, I think every one of us could call him a friend, and everyone respected him, um, not only as being a councillor, but being a very professional uh, male, as you had to say in those days, NHS nurse. Um, there was prejudice in those days, and it was sexism in the opposite direction with uh, um, male nurses. He represented Sinfin from as you said, 1974, but actually there was a, a shadow district council in 73 that he was elected to, and he was the most senior member of that council that hadn't previously had service on the county borough council that preceded it. So he, he was the first of a generation from that point of view. Um, he, he started by serving on the transport committee, and you think, transport committee, what does that cover, <coughs> the mayor's car and so on? In those days, it was an entire bus company. The corporation buses were run by a committee of this council, and he served on it. He was also on the housing committee. Again, you think of Derby Homes nowadays, but in those days, there were tens of thousands of um, council houses in the States, all run by a committee on which Ernie sat. But it was later that he really came into his own, because he became for most of the time that he was on the council, Labour were in control. And he became a chairman of what we called Tesco. 
It was called Tesco because it was the Technical and Environmental Services Committee. We might go back to that one day, you never know. But he, his knowledge as, as a trained nurse and quite a senior nurse um, gave us a lot of insight into what we had to discuss because in those days the environmental side of it was environmental health and we had to have reports of all the horrible communicable diseases that were going around Derby at the time. Um, everybody respected him, everybody liked him and we certainly hoped that he would carry on but he got to a, a, a seniority position in the, in the NHS where he could no longer stand and that's why he stood down in 1987. Um, if he'd stood, uh, we, it stood, was, there was then a, a Conservative Council, so um, he wouldn't have been able to do it. But being the most senior at that time, he would certainly have become mayor, and I think a very good mayor uh, of the city, as I'm sure you, Mr Mayor, are going to be. Please can take my congratulations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you Councillor Wood, particularly the last bit. I enjoyed that. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Tremendous. And uh, we can now stand for a referee's minute. Sorry, you're right. Tremendous performance of Derby County uh, last week. Uh, I think most of us, particularly our football lovers, did not anticipate the performance they gave at Ellen Road. And uh, it was um, absolutely amazing and absolutely delightful. And to me, uh, they bring a lot to Derby when they do things like they have done. And on Monday is going to be a great day, hopefully for Derby. And they can come back having regained what they should never ever lost. Let's see, back into the Premiership. So I'd like to say and record my congratulations to Derby County, and I'm sure yours as well, and wish them every success on Monday. I will have a word with the referee prior to the game to make sure we get those vital decisions that we'll need. <laughs> If only I could. Um, well, I said I could, but there we are. So that is uh, my final announcement. So we're now going further on the agenda. We'll go to item 11. And these extracts from uh, chairs of the committees uh, minutes. And we'll move the first one, which is the licensing committee. And uh, would the chair of licensing like to say a few words on the last minister per year before we move? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the minute is uh, quite complex uh, in, as a suspension and revocation issue under the Licensing Act of uh, 2004. Uh, basically, all it is doing is uh, addressing one of the concerns that has been over a, a period of time whereby uh, we are not allowed to share information with other parties um, in relation to revocation of a personal licence. And it's something that uh, is very difficult to do when a license can be issued in, say, for example, Exeter, mm -hmm. and that licensed uh, person is, is dealing with an issue in Derby or dealing with a pub in Derby or whatever. And so, therefore, the government have actually changed the rules to allow there to be uh, some, um, some, uh, some re rectification of, of that anomaly whereby we can actually revoke or, or, or change the license of that person who is working in Derby, albeit it's not, from, it's not one issue by ourselves. And then we inform the, the relevant body. 
So with that brief explanation, um, I just hope that uh, um, members are uh, happy with that. And so there are four uh, recommendations on there, and I move them as printed, please. And I just wanted to make two points on this. Firstly, I think the, the wisdom of, of trying to get a wider buy-in and discussion on this from uh, local authorities is a good move to be taking. And the second is, is just, um, I suppose, a way of, of reassurance that for a taxi driver, their licence is their means of income. And there needs to be a robust appeal mechanism if they're to have that licence revoked. And I was going to ask whether that is something that also we need to take any cognizance of, particularly in terms of what different how different local authorities will deal with this. Yes, if I may. Uh, yes, I may. If I may, uh, for Councillor Cares, she's referring to taxi licensing. This is nothing to do with taxi licensing. This is personal license under liquor. I suggest, with your permission, Mr. Mayor, we move them as printed. Thank you. Can I? Second, please. Okay, thank you. Right, anybody who like to speak? Can we take it then? Vote for that they're accepted. All in favour? Any against? Carried. Item 13. Put forward. Thank you, Mr. This Mayor. Minute, please. Um, this is um, the personnel committee asking members for the inclusion of an ethics statement to be added to the employee code of conduct, and um, I move the motion as printed. Thank you very much. Good Thank you. Speak. Can we move it then, please? All in favour? Any against? Carried. We're now going to announce item 14, announcements from uh, of the Council Cabinet, uh, the Leader of the Council, Councillor Poulter. Um, you wish to speak and papers are circulated. Would you like to uh, carry on, Councillor Poulter? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, can't keep you too long, but I do have a number of thank yous um, to announce, um, not least to all the members of this Council. Um, I, and as we all do, appreciate the work that goes into a municipal year. This year has been no less busy, in fact much busier than a lot of previous years, and it's taken a lot of time and effort from all members across the chamber to um, take our city forward as has happened uh, in the last 12 months. I was being heartened by the, some of the changes in the conduct and the cooperation and communication uh, amongst us fellow councillors and I'm looking for further improvement on that in the next 12 months and would hope that can be forthcoming. Um, the second a lot of thanks is to the members of the whole of my group who have uh, unstintingly supported the, the Cabinet in what has been a challenging year. There's been a lot of work, we've had a lot of looking out over our shoulders and establishing exactly what the position is in relation to our own portfolios. I believe we've done a good job at that. I believe the, the public of Derby have, have endorsed us in that role over the last um, 12 months and we're delighted to be able to have the opportunity to carry on doing so, but with a, with a focus on delivery. We as a, a cabinet are going to turn this next 12 months here in, into a year of delivery for, the, for the, um, all the initiatives, the plan that we have to take the Dar Derby City forward. Um, aside from that, uh, in relation to the Cabinet, there are no major significant changes other than the fact 
but we have to recognise that we did lose our cabinet member for leisure and culture, Councillor Grimadel, who was not re-elected. And I would like to put it on record, our thanks and the thanks to the cabinet for the efforts that you put in in the, in the last 12 months. And we will hopefully see him again in the not too distant future. That, Mr. Mayor, automatically leads me on to an announcement as to who will replace him. And I'm glad to say that we have uh, absolutely more than adequate replacement for Councillor Gremadell in Councillor Wood. There's nobody in the city better placed in terms of his knowledge and understanding and connections with the culture uh, that's, that's uh, vibrant in our city. And we're confident that Councillor Wood will be able to take up that mantle and um, do a lot of important work also that's necessary in the leisure side of that portfolio. So we'd like to welcome Councillor Wood to the Cabinet and with that uh, endorsement the, uh, the rest of the Cabinet will remain the same. They are uh, round pegs in round holes, they know what they're doing, they've uh, much, very much widened their knowledge and expertise in the last 12 months and that can only stand us in good stead for the following 12 months in which we will make a difference for, for Derby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Sir Poulter, I think it might be a good idea to go through your cabinet by name. I know that it's been circulated, and perhaps they'll be good enough to stand up when you uh, announce them so that the new members can see their faces, please. Mr. Mayor, if you'd like me to um, publicly embarrass the cabinet, that's... That's perfectly fine. <laughs> I would indeed. It would be great pleasure. <laughs> uh, so, Mr Mayor, on my right, I have uh, Councillor Matthew Holmes, who's the Deputy Leader of the Council, who's just done a, a good twirl for you. Uh, on my left, I have uh, Councillor Barker, who is a uh, <laughs> Cabinet member when he can get up for, uh, for governance and everything uh, on my left-hand side of my business. On my left here we have um, Councillor Williams, who is our most experienced and <laughs> fantastic member for children's services, whose knowledge is, is never uh, exceeded by anybody else. We have Councillor Webb with an also uh, fantastic uh, command of his portfolio in adult services. Are you right with this, Mr Mayor? Shall we carry on here? Yes. Behind me, uh, <laughs> Councillor Ralston, who's Councillor Ralston. <laughs> <laughs> On my right, we have the new member for Leisure and Culture, Councillor Wood. And again, on my far right is Councillor Jonathan Smale, who's our street pride and, and um, communities and neighbourhoods uh, cabinet member, who's extremely good at dealing with dog, dog poo and dustbins. We <laughs> did, <laughs> 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 I think you made your point, Councillor Pollock. Have I introduced yes, them indeed. to you, Mr. Mayor? Absolutely. You're, yes. you're acquainted with yes. them now. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Right, so we're going to item 15 now which is the endorsement of the Youth Mayor for the forthcoming year. Um, because of the nature of this business being this afternoon and what have you, we will not be uh, championing the Youth Mayor today. That will be done at our next meeting in July. However, we are going to recognise the fact that we have a new Youth Mayor and Deputy Mayor. And uh, with that in mind... Um, I'm going to move recommendations regards to youth mayor and deputy uh, at this juncture. And um, would somebody like to speak and make a proposal that we accept the youth mayor and seconder, deputy? Some, we need a seconder. Some yeah. So we, we need a seconder then for, for that particular post. Would somebody second it? Councillor Nater? Thank you very much indeed. Okay. All in favour? Any against? I'll, I'll tell them. <laughs> okay. Item 16. Um, we've got a list, or you have a list now, of the schedule of meetings. Okay. Um, as far as I'm aware, those meetings will be as printed. Anybody at all, I'm coming to you, Councillor Holder, anybody would like to make any comments about those uh, dates, uh, now's the time to do it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just slightly concerned about the idea of having a full council meeting during the school holidays. I'm referring to the meeting on the 24th of July, as a number of members may wish to take leave with their children uh, during that time, and wondering whether or not that meeting can be changed. I, 
I, I, view of the fact that this is the next meeting, we've, we've already confirmed, Council Hold with, with the Youth Mayor and Deputy Mayor, that we're going to appoint them on that date. I don't feel inclined to move that meeting. And this is an overwhelming majority of councillors agreeing to it. So, uh, all those in favour of, of moving that meeting now show. And those that wish to stay in situ, please show. Well, sorry, it's defeated. The meeting will remain on the 24th of July. Okay. Any, anybody else? Yes, uh, Councillor Kerr. Um, just for information, I've already mentioned to the likely Chair of Audit and Accounts that the 31st of July meeting, which is in the school holidays as well, is I would find difficult. Um, but he says he's got problems with some of the other meetings as well, so there may be some movement on those. Again, Councillor Kerr, I, you know, to be honest, we always have a Vice Chair of the meetings, and with respect, the Vice Chair is there to take meetings when the chair is unavailable and uh, really as long as they've got a quorum then that retains in situ however uh, if you make representation after this meeting we should really feel I should talk about audit and accounts today so uh, we'll leave it to that anybody else want to make a comment Institutional appointments now, okay, and you've all got your list, okay. Um, I'm aware of the fact that Councillor Paul, you want to talk about this, but is there any uh, changes that Councillor wish to make before we move to the vote, please? Councillor Graves. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I've noticed that somehow um, Councillor Evans was put on the Corporate Parenting Committee. Um, this is not, uh, he's already doing uh, his fair share of uh, meetings. Um, so I'd like to take him off that. And on the personnel committee, the same goes for Councillor Bettany. If you could uh, remove those people, please. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, sorry, sorry. Councillor Aldrich. Um, yeah, there's a slight mistake, Mr Mayor. On the Corporate Service Scrutiny Board, um, we've got Councillor Russell down um, as one of the Labour representatives. That should be Councillor Froggart. Right. We could just change we that. We can amend that. Thank Fine, you. Fine, thank you. Any, any others? Can somebody move then, please? Acceptance. Thank you. Seconder? Just one, just one second. Oh, Councillor Paul, do you want to have a word? Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Okay. Mayor, thank you. I, I didn't actually need to speak to it directly, but I think you may need to defer to uh, Alex off to deal with the, with the vacancies that uh, are still in the paper, particularly in relation to independent nominations and, and a variety of things, which I'm sure... Uh, Alex can lead you through. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Would you like Alex to speak? Yes, I would. Yeah. Uh, councillors, I understand we have a vacancy on the vice chair positions on the audit and accounts committee, and also the licensing committee. Um, Prefer council to make. Nominations for those positions. Uh, nominate um, Councillor Paul Pegg for the Vice Chair of Licensing and Councillor Joanna West for the Vice Chair of Audit and Accounts, please. Councillor Grace, Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to, on the Licensing Committee, I'd like to nominate uh, Councillor Bettany for the Vice Chair.
I will put it on. Thank you for that. Would you buy? Thank you. We'll take a vote on the licensing committee. We've got two Councillor Pegg and, and Councillor Betney. All those in favour of Councillor Paul Pegg, please show, please. All those for Councillor Bettany, please show, please. Councillor Pegg, yeah. yeah. Councillor Pegg will be the Vice Chair. Okay. There's also two votes required. Do you want to tell it to take you through? Um, I understand votes are also required um, based on the nominations to the Standards Committee and also to the Police and Crime Panel. Um, if we take the Standards Committee first, we have had nominations for Councillor Alison Holmes and also Councillor Froggart, Mr Mayor. Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, two applications. Uh, Councillor Holmes. Councillor Frogger, I'll take them in alphabetical order. All those for Frog Councillor Frogger first, please show. Can you make, there's one or two hands a little bit lower. Sorry about this, chap. It's been a little bloke, you see. Right. Councillor um, Alice Holmes, please. Councillor Alice Holmes. Alex. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the final uh, vote that I understand is required on the constitutional appointments is in the joint bodies list. It's the Police and Crime Panel. Uh, we've received nominations for Councillor Potter and Councillor Paul Pegg. We need a vote. We'll again, take it in alphabetical order. So you're going to try me, aren't you? Councillor Paul Pegg first. All those for Councillor Potter, please. Oops. Yeah, Councillor Potter wins that one on the police and crime position. Right, okay. Right, uh, I think there's one other post that uh, the leader of council wants to talk about, and that's champions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, um, I thought we got, quite got there over the page, but yes, we have a list of nominations for champions, which I would propose, but it's also my proposal to introduce a new champion to the list of uh, champions for the council, that being uh, somebody to represent and champion the, uh, the cause of the armed forces. So and the nomination for that is uh, Councillor, McCri Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right. Uh, anybody second that? Thank you. Right. Any other nominations? All those in favour, please show. Any against? Carried. Right. So we will go back now and, and take acceptance of the... Uh, Appointments at uh, the Constitutional Committees. All, all those, can somebody move? Acceptance, please. Seconder. Right. All those in favour? Any against? Carried. Thank you. Going to appointments of Naval Boards. Again, we should have a list. Two votes. Um, there are two votes required because we've got in Abbey Ward and in Mackworth Ward. Mr Mayor, yeah. may, may, I, may I have a few words before you, you we take a vote on this? You may have a few words. I, I think what I'd like to do, 
councillor Gawain first is to get those two appointments done and then you can have a couple of words. Okay. Yes, so, well, Mr. We, Mayor, it, yeah. it is quite important that I speak before we uh, have that vote. Because of the situation? Yes. Okay, well, I, I'm quite willing to accept that then. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, you'll be aware that I spoke about this at last year's AGM, and my view has not changed. I believe the council ward should choose their own chairman of their respective boards. I believe our practice of overriding the local choice of chairman is wrong and counterproductive. You may recall that last year in Alveston, where my party had a majority, we chose the chairman of the board. Although when Labour ran this council, they forced a Labour chairman on us when we had the majority. Another councillor I dispatched from elected office. In Bolton, where at the time Labour had the majority, we believed it was fair for them to choose the chairman, despite having considerable influence over changing that decision. Had we done that, it would have been unfair. I believe we should stick to that principle of openness and fairness today, Mr. Mayor. I would ask members of the Council to consider the amendments you are about to make, and I highlight two wards which are controversial. In Abbey Ward, Mr. Mayor, I'm extremely happy that we have my friend Councillor Atwell back on the benches. Abbey have elected a more able councillor to represent them, and he will serve them well. However, I cannot support that Liberal Democrats' application of Chairman of Abbey Board on the basis that Labour have two councillors. I would ask them to reflect on the message that sends out. Equally, in Chelliston Ward, I am delighted to have another friend, Councillor Ingle, back on the benches. I, now, I know how difficult it is for independents to get elected, but Councillor Ingle is a very popular man in his community reflected in the result. He is an example of how hard work pays off. Here I would urge the Chamber to support Councillor Ingle being the Chairman of the Board on the basis of two independents. Mr. Mayor, if our council is to shake off the reputation of underhandedness, depotism, and anti-democracy, then we need to show the public, quite openly, that we have changed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Graves. Um, so I take it then that you will be nominating people for those particular wards you've spoken about, and I'm going to take them as proposed. But before I do, um, are there any nominations? When I go through any nominations other than those printed, then there's a time to put forward your nomination so a vote can be taken. So I take your point, Councillor Graves. Any nominations? So, any other nominations for Abbey Ward just other than those that's Councilor printed? Oh, just one second. Did you wish to speak, Councillor Engel? Councillor Engel, wish to speak. Uh, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to speak, Mr. Mayor. Um, Thank you very much indeed, um, Councillor Graves, about to uh, no nominate me for Chair of the uh, Board of Chelliston. Um, Sean and I have been meeting about the, the Board in Chelliston, and we actually are only going to be holding Board meetings between the Ward members anyway, uh, and doing more informal meetings. So thank you very much indeed for your offer, but I will uh, decline. Thank you. Through the uh, nominations. Anybody else? No? Okay. Anybody? No? no. Councillor? No? Okay. Right, we'll go through them and we'll have a vote if, on any nominations. So we'll start with Abbey Ward. We've got two nominations for the Chair of Abbey Ward, Neighbourhood Board, Councillor Atwell and Councillor Russell. And so we'll take them in alphabetical order first. All those for Councillor Atwell, please show. All those for Councillor Russell, please show. So it'll be Councillor Atwell. The rest, all the others just go to. Uh, I, I presume, unless anybody has notified me, like Councillor Graves had, that all the others, other than the fact that Councillor Ingle has the, the um, offer of Chelliston Ward, I will go to Mackworth Ward, where there are two pegs in, uh, nominated uh, Councillor Adrian Pegg, Councillor Paul Pegg. Uh, I will again take them in alphabetical order by Christian name. I will take Councillor Adrian Pegg first. All those in favour? Okay. Councillor Paul Pegg, please. So it would be Councillor Adrian Pegg for Macris, and, and the others will remain as printed. Okay. Thank you very much. So you need to move them. Can, can I go on to item... Can, uh, can you move those appointments? Can I, can I move all those appointments, please, please show? All the appointments? Seconder. Seconder. Right, we'll show again then. All those in favour? Thank you. Any against? 
Okay, carry it. His appointments to outside bodies and charities. Again, you've got a list for the forthcoming year. And I don't wish to go through them all, but I will take any nominations or any alterations as deemed fit. We, I think we have got one or two that we need to talk about. But I, I'm, I'm seeing you, former Mayor, and, and I'll give you the opportunity of talking now. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. It's just a clarification, really. Towards the bottom of the uh, item 19, it says Derby and Derbyshire Rail Forum Board, two appointments required. We've got a councillor barker abbreviated and a councillor barker not abbreviated. Is that two different barkers or of, is there a misprint there somewhere? Well, I thought that, mate, yeah. <laughs> Can you just confirm which board that is, please? Rail Forum. Always oh, a big lad. He can do that. In actual fact, it should be Councillor Poulter and Councillor Barker. Handy Dan. Can we please nominate Councillor Joanna West for the Derbyshire Rape Crisis position that's currently a vacancy? Have we got uh, a seconder, please? We don't need a seconder. Well, right, okay. Any other nominations? No? Okay. I'm sorry, I apologise to you. Okay, so we're going to take a vote on Derbyshire County Council Investment Committee. We've got two appointments. We've got three people that have been put forward, councillors Carr, Eldritt and Wood. So a vote is required for that position for two out of three. Just one second, Councillor Paul. Mr Mayor, having consulted with Councillor Wood and his, his other engagements, he's happy to, for the other two nominations to go forward. Thank you, Councillor Ward. That will resolve that problem. Councillor Carn Eldrick will be on that particular board. Is that all? Anybody got any questions about those before we go to a vote of acceptance? No questions. Good. Uh, can I have all those in favour? We need to move. Move. <laughs> A vote, no, or a vote again, just to make sure that we're taking the T's and crossing the I's before. Right, thank you very much. We're going to item 20 on the agenda. Attendance at annual conferences. You have before you again the attendees for the conference. Do I have a seconder for that, please? Is there a seconder? Thank you. Matthew Holmes, yeah. All those in favour, please show. Not many. Any against? Okay, thank you very much. We're going to item 21. Before we deal with this, I, I'm aware of the fact... I'll come back to you, Councillor Bolton. Uh, uh, well, I'm aware... Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Evans is putting an uh, amendment to it. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I wish to propose the amendment as per the attached form. Uh, really, it's quite straightforward. Uh, before I was elected in the year 2014, I believe the rules were changed between, I'm going to name them, uh, Janie Berry and Ranjit Banway. And it was done in order to curtail the likes of smaller parties like UKIP. And I think that now should be put right. Thank you.
You've got the papers before going any further. Councillor Alger wishes to speak. Okay. Okay, I'll now take speakers on the amendment. Um, well, Mr Mayor, and I haven't congratulated you, Mr Mayor. I apologise on your election earlier today. Congratulations, welcome um, to the Thank you for that, Councillor Eldred. Um, if anybody doubted the existence of the Gravesy chain, train, they don't anymore. Um, essentially, the UKIP manifesto, Mr Mayor, this year clearly stated that they wanted Derby City Council to spend less money on councillors and elected officers and yet here they are trying to get money for themselves. Essentially what's happened here I believe is that Councillor Graves didn't get elected in South Derbyshire where he stood to be a councillor. He's probably not going to get elected as an MEP tomorrow because the Brexit party are going to trounce him um, and Nigel Farage and much as I don't agree with those he is going to get a trouncing. So he's now seeking an additional income. He's not going to be chair of corporate scrutiny um, this year so that means he's not going to get his extra allowance for doing that so he needs to get some extra money from somewhere and therefore they've put this amendment clearly this is the gravesy train we will not be supporting this amendment councillor graves not only is seeking election anywhere um, that he can um, find a position he just wants to get as much money as he can out of the public purse and we are opposed to that councillor poulter Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Br very briefly, um, our position on this is that it would be a nonsense uh, to have the leader of a group of seven get an allowance and, a, and not a group of five. So um, it was inappropriately introduced in the first place. So we'll be supporting this motion, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Grayson, to come back. Ben, anybody speaking? I would like everybody to be quiet and hear them. I, I would prefer that if you don't mind. So let's keep and listen to people and then you can make your comments after yourself and we'll hear you in the same way. Mr Mayor, you rem may remember in 2014 a recommendation came to this council that only affected my party. It was a deliberate act of the former leader, Mr Ranjit Banwait, one of the councillors I eventually dispatched from elected office. That alteration was initiated by a former legal officer of this council and was presented with relish by the Labour group over there. It was a pernicious and vindictive proposal. Since then, Mr Mayor, my party has become one of the most successful groups on the council, increasing our numbers exponentially. Last year, my group were instrumental in helping to put right some of the problems created by the last administration. And we have worked well with the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives, which I have to say is more reflective arrangement demanded by the voting public. The vengeful rule introduced in 2014 was designed to denigrate my party on the basis that we only had two members. I believe there was some justification at the time based on two members. However, I believe we now deserve proper recognition and equality as, at the same level as the Liberal Democrats. If left as it is, it means there is inequality in the political arrangements this year. In a formal confidence and supply arrangement, I believe the current rules are inequitable and I question the arbitrary figure of six members and, I, and, and it's proposed to change this to four. If all members of this council believe in fairness and equality, then you will support this minor amendment. If, however, you merely want to denigrate my group, you will oppose this amendment. I am disappointed with Councillor Eldret's comments and find her adversarial approach very damaging for her for her party and for the council. She is continuing in the vein of her former leader and look what happened to him. Mr. Mayor, I do not believe Councillor Eldret believes in fairness or equality. After all, she is merely a token councillor on this council. She was elected on an all women shortlist, which flies in the face of equality, meaning she is not the best person for the job. All my members were selected all my members were selected on their ability, not their gender. Look, Furthermore, uh, Councillor Graves, you know, I accept what you're saying and what have you, but for all that, I'd like it to be kept a little less personal, if you don't mind, please, so we can uh, go on to the vote in the right and proper way. I think you've made your point, 
So I'll, can you, I'll let you continue to the end, but please keep the uh, thing in the right and proper way. Thank you. Uh, I do apologise, Mr Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, it's, nice to have a, it's nice to have a mayor that's uh, very uh, demanding of our, of our councillors to behave properly. Furthermore, Mr Mayor, I am really surprised that Councillor Eldrick engaged in gutter politics so early in her leadership on the Labour Group. Desperate measures in Alveston and Bolton spread misinformation and lies to my constituents and saw a disgraceful personal attack on me and my family. As a mother herself, you would have thought she would have been, had more respect for the family. I thought it was just Paul Bayliss who felt it was okay to attack my family. It seems it's part of the culture of the Labour Group as a whole. Councillor Graves, you are continuing Thank you. to make Thank you, Mr. things that are irrelevant to the amendment. Okay. And therefore, I will, meet, I will meet, need, move to the next speaker, which I understand is Councillor Ashburner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to hear Labour carping on about allowances is very much a case of pot, listening to a pot calling a kettle black. How, uh, minor point, uh, however, I would suggest that to describe UKIP uh, growth in, as exponential is perhaps a bit of an exaggeration. Thank you. Right, well, any other speakers? So it's a bit complicated, so I need to vote on the amendment. Right. So what we're going to do now, obviously, vote on the amendment to see whether that's passed, and then, if so, that will become, the, obviously, the uh, seed your vote. So the, all those who, who are for the amendment, that's been circulated. All those that are against... The uh, amendment is being passed, yes. So then we now go back to the original recommendations as amended. So we now go back to the original. And it, it is the amendment that takes priority now over that. And we're going to take a vote whether that is acceptable. So can somebody move the new uh, recommendation, please? Uh, Councillor Gray, seconder. We've got to have a seconder. You <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All those who in favour. Any against? Okay, that's carried. Now the amendment becomes the rightful. Um, Substantive motion. Yeah. Okay, we're going to item 23. I'm sure you can hear me at the back. Sure, sure you can. Anyway, um, we have a report here on appointments to senior officers' roles. Councillor Poulter will move these recommendations as printed. So can you move it, please, Councillor Poulter? Can I move item 22 as printed, Mr Mayor? I'll bring my own next time. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thanks for that. We'll go to item 23, action to address climate emergency. You, you've all read about this, I'm sure. And it's going to be moved by Councillor Kerr. Would you like to move it, Councillor Kerr? Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, this is a subject which has been hitting the headlines this spring, but it's not a subject that started this spring. In fact, I was surprised to hear that the understanding that, that um, carbon dioxide can lead to climate change actually was being known about in, in the late 1800s. And certainly in the 1970s, it was something that people started talking about 
and then it's come to us faster and faster and clearer and clearer, and particularly this spring. And it's needing to be addressed because it hasn't been addressed earlier. The science is there, the research has been done, and we've had broadcasters such as David Attenborough drawing it to the attention of the public. I accept that not everybody believes it is happening, and if it is happening, it's not necessarily caused by human interference. But I believe, and so do 99% of scientists, that this is the case. And even if it isn't, it'll do us no harm to take the action. So across the board, across the country, across the globe, there is no harm in taking action. But politicians haven't. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said clearer and clearer we need to take action, but the politicians haven't yet. We're waiting. We've agreed that we will take action. There is international sort of inertia and time is passing and the, the longer we delay, the more difficult the action will become. So the people are speaking and young people particularly are speaking. On Friday, there will be a gathering of young people outside our council house to say we need to address this climate emergency because it hasn't been addressed yet. So Derby needs to take action. And the purpose of this is to say, look, even though we're not getting the global leadership and the national leadership, we can take local action. And that is completely relevant because we need action at every level if we are going to address a problem that is becoming acute. So one of the things I've always felt about taking political action is that you need three things. You need to have the research. You need to have the political... The, the, uh, a level of political, sorry, of public support for something and the publicity for it, and you need the politicians to take action. And the more local politicians, such as ourselves, who are prepared to take action, the more we will get national politicians across the board to take action as well. So it's, we are part of the solution. The longer we wait, the more challenging the answers, the, the, pro the challenging actions we're going to have to take. And we know that already climate change is costing us millions. The Our City, Our River project across the length of the Derwent is costing us millions and it wasn't needed until climate change started making the likelihood of serious flooding more frequent. And that won't be the only thing that happens. We already know that we are getting more serious winds. They don't happen every day, but when they do happen, we're finding more tiles are left off roofs. More damage is being done to our buildings, to our trees. It's adding to the cost for us as a council and for individuals. Insurance costs are going up. And it's not just wind. It's not just wind and rain. It's high temperatures. It's cold temperatures. These things are becoming less predictable, more frequent. And although they're not an everyday event, they are there more often, and we need to prevent them by reducing the CO2 and other climate change um, emissions. We can't do it alone as a council. It's not just what we do here in this building and the outreach from this building. It is across the whole of Derby. It's our businesses, our individuals, our households, our voluntary sector. Everybody has a role to play and needs to be part of the solution but somebody needs to lead and the council needs to be leading. It's our role as the elected people for Derby. So we need to reduce our fossil fuel use. We need to, whether it's used for heating, whether it's used for travel, whether it's used in, in other ways in, the count, in, in our daily lives. We need to make better use of other resources. We need to reuse before we recycle. We need to stop disposing of stuff that has an extra use in its life. We need to do more with our parks and open spaces, both to absorb the carbon dioxide and to make them places where people wish to vi visit more locally so that they're not driving or travelling in other ways to further, a further afield. It's better for our mental health. We can save money on taking local recreation. We can improve our wildlife and diversity of of the other species within our city. We can think about what we eat. We can buy more stuff locally. We're told we should eat less, less red meat. 
not just for our health, but that's also a climate change issue. So there are lots of solutions out there. There are lots of little things we can do, but we need to identify large things as well. I don't have all the answers. I don't believe anybody has all the answers. But if we work together across the council, across the city, across the business sector, across the voluntary sector, across education, we need to find those answers. We need to bring them together into a plan. We'll need, that plan will need to evolve. We won't have all the answers by the end of this year. We need to, we'll need to review it. We'll need to learn from other councils who are doing this in other areas. But unless we all work together, we are not going to get the answer that we need for the globe, for our children, for our children's children. So the first steps are here in this motion to say, let's have a working party to start to put things together. Let's get that plan set up and let's see how we can work together as a city to find the answers that are part of the global solution for our climate emergency. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Right, I believe Councillor Heldrich is going to second it. Do you wish to speak now? I do, Mr Mayor. Thank you very much. You've got five minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Care Lucy, for your speech. And I am incredibly pleased at the first meeting of this municipal year to be working together uh, with Lucy and the Liberal Democrats on this motion, particularly given the issue of our climate crisis and the climate emergency, which is, quite frankly, bigger than party politics. It's bigger than this chamber. It's bigger than all of us. So I think coming together to work on this is really important. I'm not going to focus my speech on statistics about climate change. Not only am I not an expert, not a scientist, but actually I don't think the facts can be disputed. We've all seen the headlines. We all know the extent of the disaster that we face if we don't act and act quickly. I want to start by saying thank you. Thank you that this issue is now on the agenda and so prominent. So thank you to the 1.5 million school children around the world in 134 countries who have been striking and taking action. Young people demanding that the grown-ups take action and, and take a stand. So thank you very much um, to those young people. Thank you to Extinction Rebellion, both in Derby um, and across the country, for bringing people together through non-violent direct action and demanding change and demanding that something happens now. And, and it was an absolute honour and a privilege to take part in the first Derby die-in on Saturday. Um, and it was a very, very powerful action. So thank you for that. And thank you for organisations like the Derby Climate Cl Change Coalition, who campaigned tirelessly to get the attention of the public, the media, institutions, business businesses and politicians like us. These are the people who are saying to us, we are no longer willing to stand on the sidelines and watch you not act and watch you take small gradual steps that aren't really making a difference and aren't making a difference quick enough. So thank you for not being afraid to take risks to do that. Thank you for dedicating yourselves to this, to this cause, as Lucy said, for us and future generations. And thank you to the 2,000 people who've signed a petition calling on Derby City Council to, to declare a climate emergency. And I hope that number will grow and that we will get further support. And thank you personally um, for getting me to, to sit up and, take, and pay attention and to be motivated and inspired to act both at an individual level and a political level. So that's what I want to say. I am so pleased that we are now having this up front and centre as a discussion. First meeting of the municipal year, very important. I think for years, as I've said, we've been tinkering around the edges of climate change and the climate crisis, making small symbolic changes whilst basically carry on business as usual. People make individual change and that's important. There have been efforts to reduce emissions, to improving recycling, introducing different schemes with electric cars and e-bikes as we have here in Derby, to planting more flowers and trees as I've started doing in my small way in my garden at home. The problem is many of these initiatives are small scale. A lot of people can't actually afford to buy an electric vehicle or invest in better insulation in their home. Um, and they rely on action at an individual, le uh, an inv individual level. We simply don't have time to act that slowly and that small scale at the moment. 
We, can, we cannot do anything now other than have large-scale, rapid transformation. Just 11 years. That's all we have left to limit the temperature rise or face disastrous consequences. We need a collective approach globally, nationally and locally. Some people might say, Mr Mayor, that this is not an issue for Derby City Council, that we shouldn't be uh, discussing issues such as climate change. I have to say I would completely disagree. Not only as a City Council can we talk about what we can do in our planning processes in regards to housing, whether it be social housing or private housing, what we can do in terms of transport infrastructure and active travel infrastructure and many other areas such as recycling and waste disposal. But we can also play a really lead role across the city, bringing partners and institutions together to talk about what we can do collectively to tackle this climate crisis. And let's call it that, because language is important. Let's not talk about global warming and climate change anymore. Let's not use soft, passive language. Let's talk about a climate crisis, a climate emergency, and an existential threat to this planet and the security of this planet for future generations. I absolutely urge the Chamber to support this motion. I hope all parties can come together to declare a climate emergency that, so that we can start to put together a plan to tackle the crisis that we face. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can you refrain from shouting, please? Councillor Dinzer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And can I also congratulate you on your appointment? Look forward to seeing you in many of the events out there. Um, can I add to the statements already made by Councillor Kay and Councillor Eldred and remind ourselves that just under two years ago, this council unanimously signed up to the United Nations Global Compact, where we said that we will support and pursue the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. At that time, that was a unanimous decision, and today I think is another moment for this Council to come together around this subject to send a message to the world and to the people of Derby. What we did then was actually focus on modern slavery, modern slavery and human trafficking as our main focus. We're doing great things in Derby around modern slavery and human trafficking, but we challenged ourselves to do even more. In the climate change agenda, the Council is doing many things around this area of activity. However, we do need to take this issue as an emergency and make a step change in terms of what we are doing and really consider how we can actually go forward even more quickly because the issues are dire, not just for us, not just for our children, but their children and, and their children in, in, in the future. So I would urge this council chamber to do once again by coming together unanimously supporting this resolution because it's important that we not only harness the talent and the knowledge which sits in this council with officers and councillors, but add to it through the working group which has been suggested by Councillor Kerr in proposing this motion, add to it the talent, the creativity and knowledge that exists in this city and beyond and particularly the Climate Change Coalition, which have been ceaselessly working in this area to pursue the best for the people of Derby. I think we have a golden opportunity here to get united, to give the message, but not only that, to do something more than we already are doing. And I don't want to undermine the, the efforts that are already being made by successive administrations and most importantly, the officers in this council. So I would urge everybody to join together, come together. The evidence is there, is clear, and the sooner we take this up and turn it into an emergency and start doing the sort of things that we need to do and get the working group started, hear what they have to say, 
get the best talents within the council and beyond to work together and then bring a plan to this council to see how we can actually pursue it and deliver it for ourselves and for future generations. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Carr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to take a tack of uh, dealing with the denigrators, because that's a subject I know something about. The, uh, in my previous career, I used to attend lots of conferences where, where scientists were always trying to promote their different models, because they could sell them and get cures for their university. Now, what I find it really, really hard to believe now is that all around the world we've got crowds of scientists, each pushing their own individual models, and the answers are all coming out the same. Now, I don't believe in coincidence, so I am firmly convinced, absolutely convinced, not only is it happening, it's our fault. It's absolutely our fault, and we need to do something about it. I was watching that young Swedish girl on the telly the other night talking about climate change, and, her, and she was so passionate that I, I think we should need to get more of that passion into what we're doing. And last night, there was a programme about Norway, more than 80% of the cars sold in Norway are now electric and we need to get going and maybe the council could do more about introducing charging points because according to a recent report one of the things that puts people off is the lack of available charging. Now I don't think the problem is as bad as they think it is but we need to do a lot more in terms of publicity for where you can charge your cars and uh, what was the other one? Oh yes I know in Norway they don't charge any VAT on electric cars. Thank you Mr Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Skelton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and congratulations on uh, attaining the office of mayor. Um, I think I would like to emphasise, particularly in the uh, points lower down in the, uh, the motion, that we do need to have not just, you know, obviously, a working group uh, within the council, but as it says, um, uh, meeting in public and with wide representation. That is so important because, as has already been said by, I think, all of the speakers, it's about, personally, people changing the way they live their lives, um, their behaviour, their, their, um, the consumption patterns that we all have, um, eating habits, whatever. Um, so it really does have to be a, um, a groundswell and a, of, a, of a movement from ordinary people. So there does need to be a very wide um, public education programme as well as to how people help the cause um, and do the right things so we can limit the um, temperature rise that um, is, is being predicted. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Smale. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't think no one's denying that each single one of us as residents and individuals can help to uh, change our lifestyles that we've some badly you know, gotten into. Um, as you may know that we in the, the Conservative group had a manifesto and a chapter dedicated to a clean and green derby. But as uh, me and Councillor Holmes' uh, portfolio is kind of crossing between each other, but I want to talk about with some of the work that we have done in the last year, but also with some of the work that we are going to do in the year coming up. So we have had uh, cleaner bus technology and uh, continued work with the bus companies to promote uh, cleaner travel. We've got some electric buses coming into the city, which uh, after taking a journey in myself is uh, you know, incredible and would not realise when you're on the journey yourself, that you would be actually in a bus that could actually be powered fully by electric. Councillor Carr, you talked about um, emission, um, electric charge points. Well, um, we was a successful to, in a bid to the Office of Low Emission Vehicles for 37 electric charge points across the city, such as car parks and parks and rides. Um, I'd also like to talk about um, the opportunities uh, coming up, but as most of you know, we have launched our free garden and food waste collection scheme, which started in April for those that have already got their brown bins, but also for those that do need them coming up this August. But it is important that we increase our recycling rates. We are 32% for this city. We was at one stage roughly at 55. 
So we've gone down, we've taken a bad trend, and it is responsible for all councillors of all parties to promote and support the brown bin scheme. And I would encourage every single councillor to do that. But whilst I talk about the brown bin scheme, I would also like to, to take this opportunity to announce to the council that there will be a cabinet report with cost distance being produced right now to reintroduce the blue recycling bin schemes to the inner cities of our wards, which have been removed roughly four years ago. We can't have one set of residents doing their part where other parts of the city are not doing their bit. We need to take it all together, and every single resident in this city needs to help reduce their black bin wastage. So we will be doing a cabinet paper which will be hopefully launched in this new municipal year. So we are having a new cleaner fleet strategy for our own council and Derby home vehicles, which are strong emphasis on removing combustion engines on any of our fleets anywhere in the city. We've also got a joint strategy with our Derbyshire County colleagues, which are starting to focus on bigger gains within the waste hierarchy, reduce and reuse, uh, reuse even before recycling. I would like to also talk about uh, a project that we are reaching out with, with Seven Trent Water, with a view of installing free filtered Derbyshire water in our own city centre, a commitment to reduce the single-use plastics, and we will review our leisure centres with a view to removing plastic bottles from all of our vending machines and replace them with similar water fountains. Finally, we have signed up as an exemplar member of Keep Britain Tidy, following a meeting with myself and the Chief Executive. They have agreed to work with us on a number of campaigns following the expansion of our public protection officers, a team of uniformed officers who will tackle environment crime in this city. I'm sure Councillor Holmes will touch on a lot of other stuff, particularly around air quality, but there are so many other cross-cutting projects now happening across this council, and we want to continue to lead by example whilst improving and working with businesses, groups and residents. This agenda is big, but we are on the right path and making big strides. We will be supporting this motion. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Holmes. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Congratulations on your appointment. Um, I hope you're going to do, I know you're going to do a very good job, and I welcome you to Mickle over as many times as I can get you there. Um, there's a growing acknowledgement globally and nationally in regard to climate change. Um, as others have said in this chamber tonight, the science is robust and it's consistent. Um, and while it's recognised that Derby City and indeed the UK must act, uh, we also need to look uh, much further afield uh, for others to also act as well. However, the more commit to acting, such as us today, um, it will increase the pressure on others to do so too. Um, as my colleagues just said, the Conservative group will be therefore supporting this motion. Um, I was a cabinet member back in 2010 to 2012, and my portfolio then, as it does now, um, it involves climate change, environment, and uh, ensuring that the city tackles those issues. And so, make no mistake, um, the administration now is just as committed, even if, if not more committed, than it was back in 2010 to 12. And I'm sure the respective cabinet members uh, of the other parties who have taken control um, in that, between that time and now uh, would also uh, say the same. We looked at the hydro plant, we looked at uh, establishing a firm commitment throughout the council at all levels to tackling climate change and the environment and um, big projects such as the refurbishment of the council house had it ingrained within it um, environmental issues and delivering on climate change and that has not changed in fact is being accelerated as we drive forward the many significant projects we have in the city um, and as, as the leader of council has said this year and future years are going to be of delivery uh, and that's going to form part of, of what we're going to do in terms of tackling climate change in the environment um, I would say, though, that I mean, I've said this in the Green Forum, so some of the councillors that are, that are on that and maybe members in the gallery who are part of that, that group, um, we had a discussion about the commitment of, of governments and local governments on climate change and the green, green agenda, and, and I made the point that actually um, successive governments really, I think, dropped the ball slightly, and I think it is changing now, but I think the reason was that we had momentum um, back prior to the financial crash and I think it was the financial crash, actually, that, that sort of 
push climate change and the environment a little bit further back on the agenda the, than um, where it needed to be. And it was successive governments that really have failed to act uh, in the way that they, they, they should have done. And that includes my own party as well as Labour. Um, for example, for my view, it should have been significant investment and research, research and development money into zero emission uh, vehicles, into technologies um, that would help um, this country and uh, to export that technology to other countries to deal with um, our impact on the environment. And I'm glad to see actually that the tide, I think, is changing. Uh, and that is why this motion is, is, is uh, welcome. I think that whilst we are a small cog in the overall machine, I think it's worthwhile to re-establish our commitment um, to tackling climate change in Derby and, as Councillor Smell has said, deliver a, a clean and green Derby. A um, couple of things which uh, Councillor Smell didn't touch on, air quality, which I've been working very hard on over the last um, year. Uh, it's been a huge challenge. I know there's been some criticism about um, the, how wide-ranging that uh, commitment is. Well, let me give this council and the public our absolute commitment that we are c uh, committed to delivering clean air for this city. We have a legal um, uh, requirement to deliver on a specific area of the city, but that is just the start. I can absolutely promise you that the work that is ongoing now and the, the funding that we are seeking goes far wider than that and will deliver uh, various measures to deliver clean area across a much wider area in the city. Um, E-bikes, uh, absolutely amazing uh, response to e-bikes. We're looking, obviously, to expand that as well. And that's all part of the modal shift from, um, from one type of vehicle to, to a more sustainable type of vehicle. But when we talk about the, the use of cars in closing count, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, for me, um, Nottingham is an example of where maybe measures are put in and actually doesn't actually act um, in the way that they were intended to reduce congestion or, um, and therefore pollution. I think that um, modal shift and actually zero emission electric vehicles and, and new technologies is the way forward. Um, as a package of measures and I'm very very pleased to see that um, this council this administration is going to drive forward and we very much look forward to announcing in the coming weeks very various initiatives and funding that we're going to seek and have secured to take that uh, to take that forward thank you mr. mayor thank you council Holmes. <laughs> anybody else wishes to speak now I'll take it to a vote then Oh, yes. Before I take it to a vote, I'll give the right to Councillor Kerr to sum up, if she wishes. And can I just thank everybody who's spoken so positively, and our next stage is to be ambassadors out there talking to organisations we're working with, whether they're business sector, community sector, or individuals, so that we can actually get the ball rolling. Let's be there. Let's get the vote through. Let's get gone. Thank you. So I'll take the vote with those words then. All in favour? Any against? That's carried. We'll go on to the next item, which is item 24. Thank you. Okay. We've got to item 24. Petrie Kanigi Library. Moved by Councillor Suraz Khan. Would you like to move it, uh, Councillor yes, Khan? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and congratulations on your appointment. Uh, I guess I won't be able to call you Frankie anymore for a year at least, so uh, it'll be Mr. Mayor. You can Mr. still call me Frankie as well. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, this motion is not about electioneering is not about publicity. What it is is a genuine request to this administration to rethink their strategy on closing Patry Library. Mr. Bear, Patry Library has been serving the local community and surrounding communities for over a hundred years. And as such, it will be a very grave loss to the people uh, of Arboretum and surrounding wards. Patry Library is on the main road, sorry, on the main bus route from Sinfin, Sunny Hill, Blagreaves, and also the city centre, as well as being easily accessible walking or uh, by cycling. The library 
Mr. Bear is not just a place where people go to borrow books or use the other facilities. It's also a meeting point for people from St. Finn, Blagreaves and Sunny Hill as well as city centre where people meet up, use the facilities and then maybe go into the city centre or Arbreton Park or visit the local shops. Indeed, in terms of location, this is probably one of the most ideally suited facilities that you could possibly look for in any ward to serve as a library. Mr. Mayor, to take this facility from this historical purpose-built building and to move it to St. Augustine's is one of the most poorest decisions I, I've seen since I've been a councillor in 2004. Those of us that know St. Augustine will know that it's in a side street surrounded by smaller side streets with terraced housing and narrow pavements. The area already has significant problems in terms of antisocial behavior and a chronic parking problem. To put this building there will only add to the misery of the local people and cause them more unnecessary stress. Mr. Baird, for Councillor Poulter and Councillor Holmes to stand here previously and talk about transparency and how they would like to see a committee system, the hypocrisy with which they've handled this situation is appalling. To date, we have not received any facts or figures as to what it will cost. The only thing that's been bandied about here is a ridiculous figure of one and a half million for, uh, to repair the roof. Mr. Matt, we have not seen any tenders go out. We have not seen any estimates come in from contractors who have told us what the cost would be. Indeed, we have not seen any cost as to what the total refurbishment would be of Petri Library. What we have seen is a figure plucked out of the air of 750,000 that's going to be spent on St. Augustine's and convert it into a library. Mr. Mayor, it makes no sense at all, financially or practically, to spend that kind of money converting an establishment to a library when you can actually do the same refurbishment to an existing uh, building that's purpose-built and is historical, is listed, and as I said, is the most ideally located facility you could ask for in, in any ward, let alone Arboretum, or in any city for that matter. Mr. Mayor, there was, as I said, a lack of transparency here is quite appalling. There was no mention of what would be done with the building. Now we're told that it's going to be sold. Right. And, you know, to date, there is no figures of what it might be worth. There's no figures of what you might realize as that. Are we going to sell it for peanuts or are we going to let it decay as we have done other buildings when we have said, yes, we've got a use for it? Arboretum has suffered with the closure of... Uh, you know, Shaftesbury, and we need investment in other centres. What we don't want is a facility like this to be taken away. Mr. Matt, a former leader of the Conservative group once stood here and said, we shouldn't be investing money in areas like Arboretum or other deprived uh, wards because people chose that as a last resort to live there. I wonder if the current Cabinet member is of that opinion. If not, could you possibly tell the people of Arboretum why they are taking a purpose-built facility from this area that's going to be affecting their lives for a long time and why this is being moved and going to affect the lives of the people in Normanton? To have a facility of this kind, as I said, on the corner of Will Street and Oldman Street, with narrow pavements, chronic parking problems, no bus route whatsoever directly there, it, it just, as I said earlier on, it doesn't make any sense, and I would appreciate it for the people of Derby, not just Arboretum, that everyone in this chamber looks at this for what it is, a simple ploy to take a, a, a facility away from a, a deprived ward, not because of any practical or financial sense, but simply because they can do so. I would urge you all to look at this and back this motion, not for our region, but for the city of Derby, to save an historical, listed, purpose-built building that served the community, that has continued to serve the community in terms of meeting place, in terms of what it brings to the area, in terms of 
the fact that, as I said earlier on, people meet there and go into the city centre, spend money in local shops, visit Arboretum Park. I would urge you all, please, right, just think for once of what we're taking away from our community. And, and to put it, you know, I don't know what the people of Normanton have done to this current administration to inflict more misery on them through no fault of their own. It makes no sense. I urge you all, please support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Peatfield, I understand you're second in this. Will you wish to speak now or reserve the right? I'd like to speak now, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Congratulations, Mr Mayor. Um, around 100 years ago, Carnegie awarded grants to over 2,500 communities to build libraries. Um, the grants weren't easily awarded, however. Carnegie believed in giving to the industrious and the ambitious. Communities had to prove that they would work to support the library, and elected officials had a requirement to uphold too. Local governments, as ours, had to demonstrate the need for a public library, provide the building site, pay the staff, maintain the library, and provide a free service to all. 100 years later, a surreptitious notice appears outside Pear Tree Library around about polling day a few weeks ago, notifying local residents that Derby City Council was accepting expressions of interest to acquire the freehold interest in the property. Now, I have no doubt that the new cabinet member will tell us that this is an exciting opportunity um, and that any changes must be sympathetic and that it will remain in public use um, as it states on the notice, but, but will it really? With a 1.5 million repair bill on top of the price tag, what kind of philanthropist would take on such a cost and still be able to keep the building for public use? A local library supporter recently said, a library isn't just a place with books in. And it's so true. Pear Tree Library building sits in the heart of its community. Since its closure, there's a gaping hole. There's no gathering place, there's nowhere to meet, there's no quiet space, no escape. The library had books in English, Punjabi, Urdu, Hindu, Gujarati and Bengali. There were newspapers and magazines, audiobooks, CDs, DVDs, access to the internet and email, learning packages, photocopiers, story times for children, homework club, code club, job club, health checks. All of these vital community needs have gone and they haven't been replaced. Pear Tree is crying out for a community hub. Last week, some of us attended a meeting uh, to save the library uh, and over 20 members of the, of the community met to form an action plan. An application to make the building an asset of community value has been submitted. Please, Give the community a chance to keep the building in public use. Stop the sale of Pear Tree Carnegie Library. The community are ready to stand up and fight, to fundraise and do whatever it takes to keep it in the community. And in the spirit of Carnegie, they are industrious and ambitious for their community and for the building at the heart of it. And in his own words, Carnegie said, those who, being most anxious and able to help themselves, deserve and will be benefited by help from others. We here in this chamber are the others, and we need to help Pear Tree to help themselves by funding the repairs to restore this historic building and bring it back into public use. Councillor Barker. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. It's uh, not the new uh, Cabinet member that's actually responding to this. It's uh, myself, and I'm an old one. Um, it seems yet again that I have to respond to uh, or make out the business case for, for provision of um, a new facility to replace the Pear Tree Library. Firstly, let it not be forgotten that it was the previous Labour administration that dreamt up a flawed library strategy that we are still trying to make work. Let it also not be forgotten that it was the same Labour administration that designated Pear Tree Library under that strategy as one of the four statutory libraries, knowing at that time that it needed serious restoration. And they, in actual fact, closed it prior to the election in April 2018. Let it not be forgotten 
that it was this administration coming into administration in May of 2018 that was faced with an unworkable strategy and upon completion of the building survey of Carnegie Library found severe defects which were a danger to the public and at an estimated cost to be repaired at a minimum of £1,600,000 to make it safe. Subsequently, this administration, realising that the residents of Pear Tree were in need of a statutory requirement, which was made by the previous administration, we identified St Augustine's Community Centre as a suitable place, not only as a library, but also as a larger premises to enhance the community provision and, when we've done the survey on it, provide children's services within that ward area. This has already been fitted out with a lift, so it complies with disabled requirements to access that second floor, not available at Carnegie Library. All can be achieved at a cost of approximately half of that, replacing the roof alone of Carnegie Library. The public of Pear Tree and Normanton deserve their library, and this administration will provide it for them. Specifically referring to the motion and its three recommendations. Designation of the building as a community asset. This will prolong the council's intention for the building and in recognition of that prospectus which the council intend to, to uh, forward for, to ex get, get those expressions of interest. They are required to return the building to community usage whilst undertaking the previous costs attributed to the roofing and the interior costs to be fitted out. Whilst the board, quite rightly, does say, outside the building, for sale, it further confirms expressions of interest are required by this council before we, in actual fact, award anything to whom may well put that building back into use. The criteria for that is that it will return to community use. They will be made fully aware of the on costs in relation to that. Legally, there is no condition placed on the building which prevents this council from dealing with it within that, any, any legal constraint. Finally, divert funds to repair and restore Carnegie again. As I explained earlier, the move to St Augustine's provides the public with a statutory library in a building fully capable of expanding the offer to enhance the services provided. It includes the much needed children's services and an entrance for disabled at a cost that I repeat is half that of what it will cost just to put a roof back on Carnegie. Its basic usage is therefore far, far a better option for the people of Normanton. This administration are delivering where the previous administration failed to deliver by just shelving the statutory facility and ignoring their duty, both in the library strategy and the people of Normanton and Pear Tree. I ask you to reject this motion in its entirety and let us get on with it. The residents have waited long enough. Councillor Dinza. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Barker, some of the things you just said have surprised me. You mentioned that the previous administration, the Labour knew about the the cost of repair of the roof at Derby Carnegie, Pear Tree to Carnegie Library. When we called a meeting, the local councillors in Normanton Ward and Arboretum Ward, with the then cabinet member and officers, that this is after we were not consulted at all in terms of some of the decisions and some of the findings which were leading to St Augustine being used as the new place for the library and my councillor colleague has already mentioned about the cost spent there and how that could have contributed towards the uh, improvements and renovation of Pear Tree Carnegie Library. You said that the previous administration knew about this. The officer, we asked him the question, is why has this suddenly become an issue? And he said that recently we have identified this as a, the cost is large and he started talking about the one and a half million pounds. So this disingenuous of you to say that the previous administration knew something about this and didn't do anything about that. Then you mentioned in your 
detailed response about the left being put into St. Augustine Community Centre. The left has been in the St. Augustine Community Centre previously. These are not the reasons for rejecting this particular resolution. This resolution is about a community asset in the heart of Normanton area, which includes the ward I represent, Normanton Ward, Arbreeton Ward, Abbey Ward, and it touches onto Blagley's Ward and many, many other citizens of Derby who take advantage of this particular facility. Since 60, 1967, 70, I have, as a child, school child, used the facilities of that library, and it has been an asset for many, many communities and generations. It is the heart of our community in the Normanton area. And to remove it to St. Augustine, which was also a facility which is available for the people of Derby, uh, Derby City in that area, is not right, and it should have been discussed, and consultation should have happened with local councillors. This did not happen. When we asked for a meeting with the then cabinet member, Councillor Grimmadale, he did not attend the meeting where the public joined together, started a petition, and made representations of why we should not move the, the library from the Patrick Carnegie Library building to St. Augustine Community Center. It was not listened to, it was not heard, some of the constructive suggestions were not taken on board, and you are now sitting here saying this is what's good for the people of Dublin. I think that the administration should reconsider the, the path they are taking in this particular asset for the people of Derby. It does require work doing on it. If one and a half thousand million pounds was needed for the restoration of the roof, or minimum, as Councillor Barker said, we should be looking at how we can restore that. Let's keep it in the public domain. Let's look at how we can not sell it off as an asset to somebody else, although I suspect with a starting cost of one and a half million pounds, it's going to take a long time before somebody comes forward to fill that hole before they can actually invest in something to do something with this. It will become a shell in an area where it was a thriving community and the centre of our community in the Normanton area. So I urge the administration to reconsider their course of action and take on board the suggestions and the recommendations of this resolution and work with us as the local councillors who represent the people of the Normanton area to see how we can find a solution with community groups who are also wanting to work with us to do something to save this building. So I, I, I urge you to support this motion and not reject it out of hand. Thank you. Councillor Ashburn. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Labour closed the library in Littleover. Labour has not recovered since then. Labour has introduced a scheme for library staffing, which is not going to work. This will cause... Councillor Ashburner, is it relevant to this particular library? I tried to make a yes, point I've got because it. it's Petri my motion, library. My, what my, about? My, well, my speech consists of three sentences. Uh, could you permit me to do the next one and a half sentences? Okay. Thank you. Uh, blah, 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 blah. The, uh, which is li likely to cause the closure of libraries. I therefore support the Labour amendment, uh, amendment reluctantly. Thank you. Councillor Wood. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I inherited this portfolio um, just over an hour ago, so please forgive me if I put my foot in things, but I have been a member of this council for a very long, very long time, longer than anybody else. And I remember when the county council, who ran our libraries for all those years, closed Alistair Library, closed Little Over Library. 
I remember when the present, pretty well the present Labour group, closed an asset in the, where everybody could get to, where all the buses went to. It was called the Central Library and did not an awful lot with it and tucked the library away under where we're speaking now. Um, I've been in it. I'm not terribly impressed. I was always uplifted by the uh, beautiful building in, in the Wardwick. I am also uplifted by Pear Tree Library. Every time I go past it, which is quite often, I think that is one of the most beautiful secular buildings. Perhaps the churches are better, but one of the most beautiful secular buildings in that area. Pear Tree, Pear Tree Road has always, to my mind, had an awful lot going for it. It has a police station. Where else have you got a police station in a high street? It's got a clinic. It's got a private medical practice. It's got various... Uh, religious buildings from different faiths. And I liked what Councillor Peatfield said because she'd done her research on, on Carnegie because this motion starts by saying the Petri Carnegie Library was built in 1913, I think it was 1915 actually, uh, and gifted to the city by the philanthropist Andrew Carnegie. It was four years before he died and I, I doubt very much if he'd even heard of Derby or, or anything of the sort. Councillor Peatfield was right. He was a billionaire. He'd made all his money on the backs of steel workers in America. He, he came from Scotland and he set up a trust. That trust is still going. We used it when the playhouse was built in Derby. I think I'm still allowed to call it the playhouse because it was at the time. And, and Carnegie money went into that. And it went into this. And Councillor Peatfield is quite correct. We had to fulfill, or our predecessors had to fulfill a lot of criteria, including the fact that it was the council building and doing it on the rates. I've heard a lot of nonsense today about St. Augustine's being tucked away round the corner. It, it's not far. It's, it's two streets away. Uh, you can walk it in five, six minutes, I should think. There are no buses, we're told. Well, what are all those green things going along Upperdale Road, for goodness sake? Uh, you've only got to walk up Wilton Street from there. Um, St. Augustine's needs some money spent on it, has done for a long time. It's one of our most neglected community centres. It can easily fulfil the, the function of library. And the proposed sale of a building, with all the restrictions that would be on it, yeah, we don't know whether it's going to be successful or not, is bringing private investment into Pear Tree. Surely you want investment into Pear Tree. The reason it was closed was because the roof was falling in. That was neglect, neglect of maintenance over all those years, not necessarily by this council, but by the county council in particular. Uh, like a lot of our buildings, money hadn't been spent on it all those years. Somebody goes in to inspect it, and yes, it's dangerous. Do you want to keep a library open that's dangerous? Of course you don't. But where are you going to find the money if you won't allow private investment into it? This motion just says, oh, go and find the money from somewhere. Well. I think you need to be a bit more specific. What budget should it come out of? What aren't you going to have if you're going to spend 1.6 million or whatever it is on this building? I think we've got to be realistic. We're providing a facility in that area. It's not going. It's part of the statutory provision. I'm not prejudiced either way on private and public. I want to do the best I can for the library strategy that we've been left on inherited from you. We've had to put a lot more money into it. I know um, my colleague will, will tell me that because it was underfunded when Labour left office. But let's get St Augustine's going. Let's do something really good for that area with that very beautiful listed building. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, I've been listening to the debate, quite interesting. I mean, it is a historic building and it does belong in the community. I'm more than happy to support this motion. Uh, I'm supporting this motion based on uh, Councillor Barker's, uh, the three bullet points. I think they are already being met and I do agree with that. Um, this is an important uh, community asset um, and every option needs to be explored. Uh, the last thing uh, we need on our hands is uh, what the Labour administration left us with the uh, Shaftbury Centre, uh, which is uh, derelict at the moment. Thank you. Councillor Sain. 
before I say anything on the motion, can I congratulate you on taking up the office of the mayor of the city of Derby? Um, Councillor Wood, I'm actually quite heartened, and I, although you've been a councillor for a long time, and I've been around for 20 odd years, maybe slightly longer, um, I think your heart is in the area, and you probably visit that area more often than probably any of your other colleagues. So I think you have got a very good understanding uh, on planning issues, building issues, and, and, and building history uh, as such. And you do recognize a gem when you see one, and I think Without any doubt, Beatty Library in that area is a landmark building. Now, if everything was as straightforward as Councillor Barker uh, has made out, then I would probably not be getting up and, and saying anything because that should have put us to shame that we didn't do anything about it. But the reality is, Councillor Barker, when the library was closed down for repairs, there was no indication given by any of the officers that the repair cost is beyond our means or, 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 or is going to cost us too much and we haven't got enough money in the capital budget. Our capital budget, I don't know how much it is for next year or was this year, but it's been running at around about 150 million and I think if we put our mind to it, money will be found. And if you think that important building needs to be conserved and needs to be rehabilitated because it's a landmark building, in an area which is generally regarded as quite deprived. Petri Library is acting as a community hub. It attracts people everywhere. And that uh, hub is actually contributing to lots and lots of other activities. And I don't think actually St. Augustine might be able to provide a basic library service. But the other community uh, uh, facility uh, activities which regularly take place, I don't think will actually happen uh, in, in, in St. Augustine. It is more difficult to get. I mean, as Councillor Khan said, Petri Library is on a bus route, whether you are traveling down Normanton Road, coming down Darius Road, or traveling from Cavendish. Whereas, it is going to be more difficult for people to get to um, uh, the St. Augustine Community Center. There is no doubt about that. But it, 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 it does. But, but, if you look at the Petty Library, you've got three main roads close by its location. You haven't got the same facility. In any case, I think it's a, it's a, it's a landmark building, and I think that area needs to conserve whatever it can. Because in the past, we have gotten rid of some beautiful churches. Lots of other older buildings have been demolished in the name of modernity or whatever other considerations were. We've seen destruction in that area. That is the only building that I can think of, perhaps apart from St. James's Church, which is still regarded as a significant building, and is still there. And I say, if this building was located in Elstree or some other part of Derby City, I can guarantee you there'll be uh, uh, an uproar uh, of, uh, uh, about the closure of that, that building, or put in Put in, put in the life of that building at risk because for various commercial reasons, I can't see anybody actually taking over that building because it's going to have lots and lots of restrictions in terms of it is a listed building. Why would anybody even take it for a penny when they think they're going to have to spend at least 1.6 million pounds on it? Then in terms of where will they get their money back? If they, if they invest 1.6 1. million pounds, in that building, they need to some, see some sort of return. And there's going to be all sorts of restrictions in terms of what can be done in there and what can't be done. At the end of the day, I think that building is suitable for providing a public service of some sort. If you're lucky, we might get expression of interest from some, some other public service provider who might be able to get a grant from lottery funds and various other historical grants. And we might be able to save the building in that respect. But other than that, I can't see us selling it to private concern to attract investment, private partner uh, investment, that's it. But the, the most important thing is building needs to be saved at any cost in my view. And I think you should have a serious reconsideration about what you're going to do about that building. And if possible, please save it. Thank you.
Councillor Lignall. Thank you, Mr Mayor, for the uh, opportunity to speak. Um, I have to think about what happened in Chelliston Ward over the last couple of years where the Rosen Crown was ripped down and there was nothing we could do to save it. I think also about Alastry Hall that has been for sale for 30 odd years for a pound. Nobody's coming in to buy that. And I just think when you've got a chance to save something of a bit of heritage, perhaps you should. So well, I will be voting for this. I think it does need saving and I think we need to preserve our heritage. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Briefly, um, just let uh, just on, let's draw it back a little bit. And actually, um, I can confirm that this is not a situation of our making. It's not a situation of our choice. What was the what is the fact is that this is a very very old building. There was a, a long list of maintenance requires on this requirements on this building. It was known that there were problems with the roof. The extent of it wasn't known until they started to do some surveying work on it, and consequently it was closed. And, and there is no doubt that it's massive, substantial work that needs doing on that roof. And we, as an as a administration, fully acknowledge and understand that this rightfully was, uh, or a library in this area, was designated as a statutory requirement for libraries. This is why we're looking not to, not to just close uh, that library and, and do up a, a library in Sinfin or something. We need an, a, a library and an improved and a proper facility, a 21st century facility for the library facility in that area, and that's why we're looking at St. Augustine's. We're actually not looking to sell the building. It's up for sale, yes, with a board, but actually our, our preferred requirement result would be for it to come out that there's a, a sufficient community interest or somebody that can make a community use of this building then we would fully support and go along with that but at the moment I'm afraid maybe Councillor Dinser inadvertently put his finger on the, on the, on the issue you know if this, if this genuinely is one and a half million pounds plus money needed spending on it it's not a commercially viable building you, you know people you say it would take a long time for people to come forward. I suspect nobody will come forward to actually revamp that building because whatever can you do with it, uh, with however much money you need spending on it, it's, you're, you're at that, that balance where you either knock it down and start again and build a proper purpose-built brand new 21st library per chance if you've got that amount of money. But if you open it, if you ideal, as I say, if somebody's got the money, come on down, we'll talk to you. But uh, that's where the balance is. There's a, there's a very fine balance here between whether that building in its current state can be commercially viable for any other use. But it's certainly not commercially viable for a council library uh, to the standard that we want, that we want to bring it to. Um, so that it, over, over and all, um, just to point out, this is not what we want to do. This is what we need to do for the community we need a, a good strong library there there are lots of there are lots of communities around the city that could do with better libraries better sports facilities better parks but overall there's a balance uh, on we've talked about the capital program there's massive demands on the capital program we'll learn in in, in weeks to come that there's a there are multi-million pound pressures on our medium-term financial plan and actually you've got to come to a point where you've got to make a decision as to the viability of a particular premises and balance that against what you can provide somewhere else, but with an appropriate facility. So, Mr Mayor, that was all I wanted to say on the subject. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in terms of this overall proposal, 
you know, in terms of the actual library, I was very much of the same mindset, beautiful buildings, perfect, you know, purpose-built library, absolutely, as was the library in the city centre, which was closed down. Unfortunately, in this current scenario that we've inherited from, and, and the council as overall current budgets, we are going to have a really tough time balancing our books. You know, that isn't, a, that isn't going to, we can't hide that, that isn't something we can pretend. We have to make some really difficult decisions over the next few years. We've got an MTFP that has gaps, massive gaps, and our capital budgets have been decimated for various reasons. I won't even begin to talk about the A52 or other major problems, but our capital spend, we've got pressures in our children's services and our adult services. We've got special, we have lack of specialist school provisions in the city and we're outsourcing them across the rest of the country in some times. And this capital spend money could be utilised to create an overall benefit for our general spends. We have to look at this really sensibly. And as much as I'd love to say, wherever that magic money tree is, that we should pull out and make this building look absolutely beautiful and restore it to its historic value, I, would, I hope to goodness that um, Historic England see that and come forward and, and reinstate it. But we as a council cannot afford to do it. As much as I would love to, we have to prioritise our budgets and we have to think sensibly and do what we should be doing for the public purse and keeping an eye on things. We can't justify when we've got a facility within the area, close to the area, that is in a walkable distance, to justify using this money when there are other things that we need to be looking at as a city council to balance our books and to create a much better environment for the city and for the people of Derby. Um, and I'd encourage everybody here to think logically, think sensibly, as much as you know, we look at everything going off in the council, we have to think about our future for the, for the whole of the city, and that is an awful lot of money that could be utilised in a much better way. And I, you know, I'd, I'd love to say we could find it from somewhere, but we cannot com continue to decimate our reserves and our capital budgets um, without thinking more, forth, more, more about the future. Thank you. Right, I'm going to move to a vote, okay? Uh, but before I do that, <laughs> that did you, didn't it? Before I do that, I invite the proposer to sum up. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Actually, I'm not surprised at the ambiguity and the sort of economy with the troop that's coming from Councillor Barker, Poulter, and, and a few of his allies. As I said at the beginning, all we've had is mention of some of the figures that they have brought about without any documentary evidence. We've not seen a contractor come and say, yes, it's going to cost you this much. Where does the figure of 750,000 come from for St. Augustine? You know, who's gone there and said this is what needs doing to it? This administration basically is scaremongering about the roof. For God's sake, Mansions are built for less than 150 of, of one and a half million pounds. Are we, you know, putting gold tiles on the ceiling of, or on the roof of this building? You know, I just can't believe that Councillor Barker, yes, he's not, he wasn't the cabinet member then, but he's trying to defend something that he's not aware of. When you talk about consultation, we received no consultation as councillors. Indeed, when a public meeting was called at St. Augustine's, Councillor Grimmerdale chose not to attend and sent an officer down, who I felt sorry for because, you know, he was in a turkey shoot. He couldn't answer some of the questions that we were asking him or the members of the public were answering. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Councillor Poulter talks about the economic viability of this. Councillor Rolson mentions, oh, we'd love to have money to spend. Look, as an authority, we spend money on the needs of our communities. We spend need money on the needs of this city. And this is something that's needed. Council Poulter talks about the fact that we, you know, can't get private investors because they want... Well, if you can't get private investors today, what makes you think you're going to get them when it's been derelict for a year and the roof's caved in and there's more damage to the property? Let's have some common sense at this, right? And, and you know, treat it for what it is. A historical building that can be brought into use that serves communities of at least four wards as well as the city centre. Now, we have new housing coming up on the Castle Ward Estate and the old DRI site. So all these new houses are going to be put and we've taken the facilities away from them. Councillor you know, Wood I, I, is a friend of mine. I like the chap since I've been 
uh, a councillor, but we've served on the planning committee for, I don't know, 15 years. He talks about the bus route. Yes, I agree with you, there is a bus route, but can you tell me where you'd find a facility where you have actually three bus stops within 25, 30 yards of this? This is a facility where people with wheelchairs, as was mentioned, can actually go around that. There's a green, people can sit outside it. Can you do the same at St. Augustine with narrow pavements are right on the corner of Wellen Street and that? You know, a lift going upstairs you know, to the facility. Well, if you have facilities downstairs for disabled people, why do they need to go upstairs? So the fact that there is already, already a lift at, at uh, St. Augustine is not the conservative administration putting it there to serve the community. It's there already. So, you know, what we'd like in this chamber is for you to reconsider this. The fact that you, all of you know that this building will become derelict. There will be no use for it. There'll be no private people coming in to do that. What can you do there? It's not in the city center where you can knock it down and build apartments and a, a developer could make money from it. That the building is going to end up like Shaftesbury did. You know, derelict like the Bowling Green, uh, uh, of Reton Bowling Green did in you know, Rosal Street, it's, it's going to cave in. We will get no money for it and yet we will let this historic building become derelict, become dilapidated and take the use away from it to put it to St. Augustine. All I'm asking you is to reconsider and let's have some proper, and I mean proper facts and figures. You know, send out some tenders, ask people, ask the contractors to return them to you to say how much they will cost. Where do you get these figures from of one and a half million for a roof? Stately homes cost less than that to repair. You know, let, let's not take this lightly. If you are seriously considering, you know, what you are, then at least, you know, give the people of Derby and the opposition councillors a clarity as to why you're doing this, apart, to, apart from just saying, oh, he needs a lot of money spending on it. Well, St. Augustine needs a lot of money spending on it. They've already plucked out a figure of 750,000. We don't know what they're going to do with that. We don't know who's given them that figure. So, you know, let's have some clarity as to what you intend to do in terms of refurbishment that's going to cost so much at the Carnegie Library and it's going to cost so much at St. Augustine. Stop stab you know, stop this ambiguity and for God's sake, stand up for what you once you know, advocated here. That's transparency, more involvement in the committee system. Well, who have you involved in your decision making? You've kept secrets from the local council, you've kept secrets from uh, the people of Derby. Nobody knows where you get these figures from. Nobody knows how you arrived at these figures. And yet you, you sit in this you know, chamber and, and talk about what we can do and what we can't do. I honestly, you know, I'm totally appalled by even now that the fact that you won't send out tenders and you won't bring proper facts and figures to this chamber. Thank you. I'm going to move to a vote now. Would members please indicate when I read their name whether they are for or against the uh, motion as printed, please. Councillor Ashburner? For. Councillor Aptwell? For. Councillor Barker? Against. Councillor Kerr? Councillor Cooper? Yes. Councillor Dinza? Yes. Councillor Eldritch? Yes. Councillor Hassel? Yes. Councillor Hazelgrave? Yes. Councillor Allison Holmes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Matthew Holmes? Yes. Councillor Hudson? Yes. Councillor Hussein? Councillor Ingle. Councillor Jangir Khan. Councillor Shiraz Khan. Councillor Lind. Councillor Marshall. Councillor McChrystal. Councillor Nater. Councillor Nawaz. Councillor Patterson. Councillor Pierce. Councillor Peatfield. Councillor Adrian Pegg. 
Councillor Paul Pegg. Councillor Potter? Against. Councillor Poulter? Against. Councillor Repton? Repton. Councillor Repton? Oh, <laughs> 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 Councillor Alston? Okay. Councillor Russell? Four. Councillor Sandu? Four. Councillor Shanker? Four. Councillor Skelton? <laughs> sorry, Councillor. Sorry, Councillor Skelton was that abstain. Councillor Smale. Councillor Testro. Councillor Webb. Councillor West. Councillor Williams. Councillor Willoughby. Councillor Wood. And the Mayor, Councillor Howard. Okay. It's lost. The motion is lost. The motion is lost. Okay. Thank you very much. I, uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending. And I'd like the way you've conducted the meeting tonight, this afternoon, sorry, may it well continue. And I close the meeting accordingly. <laughs>